Hi everybody, uh, we are going to see today the normal doctor examination. Uh, as we understand, sorry, as we understand, we had the previous two sessions on the anatomic understanding of echocardiography, which included the basics and also the sequential segmental analysis. What we are going to see today is the functional information which we get from echocardiography, which is through the doctor examination. Uh, the outline of the talk, uh, uh, it would include the principles of Doppler, uh, the individual Dopplers in detail, and then the applications. Uh, the principles, we understand that Doppler echocardiography includes primarily the pulse Doppler, the continuous wave Doppler, and the color flow Doppler. The color flow Doppler component we have finished in the first session. So what we will see today is the pulse and the continuous wave Dopplers. The individual Dopplers at different levels. Uh, how do we get those Dopplers and also the normal Doppler tracings, the waves and its velocity. And at the end, we will see what do uh, we get in terms of inf in information from the particular Doppler tracing. So first of all, we uh, have to understand that today's talk is going to be limited to the postnatal Dopplers. The internal Dopplers are quite different and uh, we have at some point in time included them in the fetal echo and we could do it in the future. What we will see is all postnatal Dopplers. The uh, important thing is that the Doppler velocity curves um, uh, would reflect the hemodynamic events either in a chamber, across a valve or within a vessel. So at these three junctions we need to Doppler. Also, uh, remember that higher the frequency of the probe, greater is the resolution, but lesser is the penetration. So, for example, you have a 12S probe, your resolution is beautiful, but your penetration is very little. Juggle with the probes when you start from subcostals and then proceed up. And the doctors are done at the tips of the level, uh, tips of the leaflets of the valves. As you can see in the figure, the the cursor is put at the tip of the interruption. They, um, we just went through what we are going to see in the talk today. And now we are at the second slide of uh, principles. So what we discussed is uh, that the cursor has to be placed at the tip of the leaflet whenever we are having a doctor understanding of the uh, AV valves or the similar valves. And you will get the highest amplitude uh, and the velocity signal at the tip of the leaflet. Uh, the uh, Doppler uh, gives us an understanding about four things. One is that it tells us the velocity of the flow. Second is it tells us the direction of the flow, whether it's above or below the baseline. The third is the intensity of the flow. And fourth is you can time that Doppler velocity with a particular cardiac event. So these are the four informations which we get from the spectral Doppler display. And as we said before, there are two types of Dopplers, the pulsed wave and the continuous wave. What is the difference is uh, the pulsed wave Doppler is done at a particular uh, point, whereas the continuous wave Doppler will pick up all the signals across that line. So a pulsed wave Doppler, as we understand, there is a beautiful range resolution. However, there is a limit to its maximum velocity, which is usually around 1.5 to 2 meters per second. Whereas for a continuous wave, as we understand, there is no range resolution, but it does not have a limitation to maximum velocity. And hence, you can pick up velocities even as high as 4 to 5 meters per second. There are two basic principles which we are going to use as we proceed further in the talk. One is the modified Bernoulli's equation, and second is the hydraulic orifice formula. These two equations are going to help us understanding the hemodynamics, how to calculate the cardiac output, etc. There are a few things which will make a difference in the quality of the Doppler which you, which you do, uh, and they are called the Doppler controls. The first is uh, the gain, scale, and the wall filter. Most of the machines will have these uh, knobs uh, readily available where you could increase or decrease to optimize your quality of Doppler study. The gain is going to make it more wider. The scale increasing is going to make it uh, a little uh, less 
uh, whiter and the appearance of the graphic display can be manipulated by the scale and the baseline. That means you can lift the baseline up or down and reduce or increase the scale for an optimal uh, appearance of the velocity dopplers. And the sample volume and pulse wave, as we say, the continuous wave does not have a particular sample volume. But for pulse wave, you can use your cursor, the sample depth, depth and the angle to optimize the point at which you want to Doppler. Now, with this basic understanding, we will go to the individual Dopplers. The first Doppler we are seeing is superior vena cava. So we are going to go systematically from the right heart and then to the left heart. The first is the superior vena cava, which you can see from the subcostals and the suprasternal views. Remember that after getting the 2D picture, you will put the color Doppler on before you try to take the pulse or the continuous wave Doppler. So in the subcostals, you know that it's the red flow which comes. As we can see in this figure, the red flow entering towards the probe is going to be the SVC, and hence you will see your Doppler pattern above the baseline. Or in suprasternals, it's going to be below the baseline because it's going to be blue in color. Now, what Doppler pattern we see in superior vena cava is seen in this uh, clipping or also in the diagrammatic representation. What you see above the baseline is going to be the forward flow, that means it's towards the heart. And what you see below the baseline is a retrograde flow. And there are three waves in the SVC. The first is called the S wave, the second is called the D wave, and the third is called the A wave. The S and the D are positive waves, and the A is a negative wave. The positive waves, the S1, is during the ventricular systole. This is the largest waveform in SVC, and it's produced because of the relaxation of the right atrium, and at the same time, the tricuspid valve descends down in ventricular systole. So S means it's a systole, but it's the ventricular systole. The second wave is the D wave. That means it's during ventricular diastole. That means the tricuspid valve is already opened up, and there is rapid ventricular filling. So what you see is this is the earlier part of diastole. And the D wave is usually a little lesser in velocity compared to the S wave. And the third one is the A wave, which is related to the right atrial contraction, which is the second part of the diastole. And this means that it's an active event where the right atrium contracts and it pushes the blood in a retrograde way back away from the heart. So that is where the A wave is formed. So S, D, and A wave, S wave velocity is more than the D wave. This is normal Doppler pattern. Now, remember that the right and the left heart structures have some changes which happen during respiration. So what happens during inspiration is that you have the S wave velocity increasing, the D wave velocity increasing, and the A wave velocity reducing. Now, this is what happens because of the changes which happen on inspiration in the intrathoracic pressures, which have, has an implication on the venous return. So the right-sided heart structures have increased venous return on inspiration. So the SVC is going to see show changes like this. So whenever you're taking a Doppler pattern, remember that you'll have some changes during inspiration and expiration. And to find a velocity, you could consider a mean of overall. Usually the S wave peak is around one meters per second, but it could go up to two meters per second. So this is what is the superior vena cava Doppler. Coming down to the next inferior vena cava and hepatic vein. Commonly, you would see the inferior vena cava and the hepatic vein from the subcostal view. As we can see this figure, the IVC uninterrupted entering into the right atrium and the hepatic veins can be seen just adjacent to the IVC and commonly the hepatic veins enter the IVC and then join together. Sometimes you could have had separate insertion of hepatic veins into the right atrium. And then the flow is in blue because it's away from the probe entering the right atrium. Now, here can we see that even IVC and hepatic veins have a similar flow pattern. 
I have put it above the baseline only for an for a correlation with the superior vena cava Doppler pattern. Otherwise, it's going to be below the baseline as you can see in this um, uh, echo clipping. And we can see that it's a flow, venous flow, which is most of the time throughout the cardiac cycle, but it does have a wave pattern. And it has similar wave pattern as SVC. Uh, it has the S wave, which happens during the ventricular systole, and the D wave, which happens during early ventricular diastole. Now, in addition to this, the hepatic veins has one extra wave, which happens at the end of systole, which is in a negative fashion, which is called a V wave. So this is the hepatic vein. And the A wave also is there at the end of the uh, diastole. So the later part of the diastole has the A wave. So in short, it has the S, D, V, and A, and also the IVC shows changes with inspiration, wherein the S and the D wave increase in amplitude. The peak velocity is almost similar to the SVC velocities. Now coming down to the next Doppler pattern is the tricuspid valve inflow. The tricuspid valve inflow can be beautifully obtained from a four-chamber view or sometimes the parasternal short axis view. As we can see in this figure, the four-chamber, you put your cursor just below the tricuspid valve leaflets on color Doppler. And what tracing you would get is going to be like this. Now, in terms of a diagrammatic representation, you can see here that we have flow during only a part of the cardiac cycle, unlike the venous flow. And we have two waves in diastole, the E wave and the A wave. So this is only the diastolic flow. In systole, we do not normally have flow across the tricuspid valve. The E wave represents the early part of the diastole, and the A wave is the later part of the diastole. So E stands for early filling, A stands for atrial contraction. The starting point of diastole is named as D point, and the ending point of diastole is the C point. That means the AV valves close at this C point. So we have the D, E, A, C, and some people name the middle point between the A and C as the P point. So this is during diastole, when the, the AV valves open and the AV valves close. The rapid ventricular feeling and the atrial contraction usually has a particular ratio. The E wave velocity is more than the A wave postnatally, but this is not how the doctors are going to look during fetal life or even during early neonatal life, or for that matter, the preterm babies have the E wave velocity lesser than the A wave. The A wave is the atrial contraction. That means that the active filling and the filling depends upon the ventricular compliance. And hence, the stiffer ventricle is going to have taller A waves in general. But normally, the ventricular compliance is much better and because of which, the A wave velocity is lesser than the E wave. Normally, the EA ratio in children is approximately 1.6, and the E peak velocity is usually 0.6 meters per second. What happens on inspiration? It increases again because it's a Doppler on the right side of the heart. The peak E velocity increases, and the peak A velocity also increases. So you can see that the E increases by 26%, the A increases by 18%, but still the EA ratio is not altered. As you can see in this figure, the E and A, everything reduces and everything increases. This is expiration and this is inspiration. But the EA ratio always remains the same. The Doppler pattern can also help taking the P 
peak velocity and the mean velocity or the EA ratio, most of the machines, if you um, can actually trace this Doppler or put a Doppler a cursor at the E and the A, the machine automatically will calculate the EA ratio, which is around 1.2. And also you could calculate the deceleration time, deceleration slope, etc. Coming to the right ventricular outflow and the main pulmonary artery, Dopplers. These Dopplers can be taken from the four chamber or it can be taken from the subcostals in the parasternal. The ideal place to take the right ventricular outflow Dopplers would be the parasternal long axis because the alignment is ideal in this view. Remember that if your cursor is going to be below the valve, at the valve and above the valve, the Doppler pattern may change a little bit. As we can see, we have a single uh, tracing during systole. So this is ventricular systole towards the pulmonary artery and no flow during diastole if you put your cursor below the pulmonary valve. So you have a single systolic waveform. If you put your cursor across the pulmonary valve, you will find the opening and the closing of the pulmonary valve. And the single flow has an understanding called acceleration time. The acceleration time is the time taken from the starting of the systole to the peak of systole. And you can get it in all the machines if you use the uh, thing of time where you put the cursor first at the beginning and then at the peak. The peak velocity to the beginning is the acceleration time. And if you put the cursor below the um, I'm sorry, above the pulmonary valve, then it's going to be a little higher velocity compared to below the pulmonary valve. So the peak velocity increases as your cursor proceeds further. However, the acceleration time shortens. So you can see here the acceleration time, and when it's above the valve, the acceleration time becomes a little shorter. So this is the normal Doppler pattern. If the cursor is above the pulmonary valve, you might find to some extent a retrograde flow and that happens in the earlier part of diastole because of the blood flow again going back and hitting the closed pulmonary valve. The peak velocity across the RVOT is usually around one meters per second. A small forward flow can be seen later part of diastole because of the right atrium contracting actively. This correlates with the A-wave which we found on tricuspid valve Doppler or the retrograde A-wave which we saw in the systemic venous Doppler. So this is about the main pulmonary artery. Now coming to the left heart, we need to Doppler the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary venous Doppler is not that difficult to obtain though the velocities might be less and you need an accurate uh, point placement of the cursor of the doctor. Usually it is done in the apical four chamber, but you could also use the parasternal or suprasternal short axis or the typical crab view, which uh, will show you individual four pulmonary veins. And then you could Doppler the pulmonary veins at its length till they enter into the left atrium. But remember that as you come closer to the left atrium, your Doppler pattern would be little altered because then it's going to mimic your left atrial Dopplers. So ideally you need to Doppler it one to two centimeters away from its orifice of the left atrium. And it also has a similar venous pattern like systemic veins where you have the S wave, the D wave and the A wave. Now the S and the D wave, as you can see in this figure, is because of the flow which happens in a forward way. That means the flow is towards the left atrium and the A wave is away from the left atrium. It is a retrograde flow. Again, the S means it's the left ventricular systole. The D is the left ventricular diastole and the A wave is the later part of diastole. Now the S wave, as we understand that the flow is 
towards the left atrium is because of the atrial relaxation and the suction effect because of the mitral valve displacement down into the left ventricle. The diastole D wave is because of the mitral valve opening and suddenly the LA pressure is decreasing because of which there is a lot of flow entering from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. Now, in spite of the diastole continuing, the atria contracts and that produces a retrograde flow back into the pulmonary veins. The peak S and the D velocity is usually the same in pulmonary veins in contrast to the venous Doppler which we saw for the SVC IVC where the peak S was more than the peak D. So as you can see here, the S and the D wave peak velocity is closer to uh, being same. And what happens on inspiration? So here we have to understand that. Uh, negative intrathoracic pressure during inspiration is going to pull a lot of blood into the chest and reduce the input into the pulmonary veins because of which your Dopplers will be reduced on inspiration. So what happens is the S, the D wave peak velocity reduces on inspiration. However, the A velocity remains unchanged. See here that the S and the D, the in-between point does not reach the baseline. Coming to the left-sided AV valve, the mitral valve, similar to the tricuspid valve, the ideal view would be the four-chamber view and put the cursor at the tip of the leaflet. We have a flow in diastole where you have the E and the A wave and the D point and the C point. So the E and the A and the D and the C. Now you can see in this uh, figure because you have a little amount of space between the E and the E, this happens when you have relative bradycardia. And if you have tachycardia in some children, you might have to some extent overlapping or fusion of the E and the A wave and the E and the A peaks may be very close to each other. So we have the D point that is the starting of the uh, opening of the mitral valve, the E peak point, which is sort of uh, the flow which happens between the LA and the LV because of the pressure. And then we have the A point because of the left atrial contraction, the B point in between the A and the C, and the C means the closure of the mitral valve. The peak E is always bigger than the peak A, however, not in antenatal period and postnatally early in life. The ratio between the E and the A is usually 1.7, which is very closer to the tricuspid valve. What happens in inspiration? So this is very important understanding. On inspiration, as we understand, the left-sided heart Dopplers are going to show reduction in the peak velocity. But interestingly, the E peak reduces and the A peak remains unchanged. This is in contrast to the tricuspid valve inflow Doppler where the E and the A both increased on inspiration. Also that overall the change in respiration is much lesser on the left heart compared to the right heart. So whatever reduction on inspiration we see is only up to 9% for the E wave compared to the tricuspid valve Dopplers where the increase was up to the extent of 25%. This understanding is important because it's going to help us for further understanding of myocardial and pericardial diseases like restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictor pericarditis. So now with this understanding, we come to the left ventricular outflow Doppler. We need to Doppler the left ventricular outflow tract again at three points, the subvalve, the left ventricular outflow tract, the aortic valve, and then the supravalve above the aortic valve and then also proceed to the ascending aortic doppler and the descending aorta doctor. The ideal chamber would be the apical four chamber for left ventricular outflow tract. However, for the ascending aorta, you could use the high right parasternal or suprasternal view and the descending aortic doppler needs to be done in the suprasternal and also the subcostal where you see the diaphragm at the level of diaphragm descending aortic Doppler tracing is extremely important in children in order to rule out abdominal or low thoracic coaptations. So as we can see here, again we measure the peak velocity 
and also the acceleration time. The peak velocity, you put a cursor at the peak of the systolic flow waveform which we see, and the acceleration time is the time taken from the starting to the peak of reaching its point. Again, when we Doppler at the aortic valve, you can see the valve opening and closing. And then coming to the supravalvular area, very interestingly, the peak velocity increases and also the acceleration time reduces. So the peak velocity is higher and it can go up to 1.5 meters per second. Remember that this peak velocity in the supravalvular aortic area is higher than the subvalvular and also even higher than the main pulmonary artery. Like main pulmonary artery, you have a small retrograde flow in the earlier part of diastole because the blood flows against the closed aortic valve in a back way. And uh, this is very similar to what we saw in the main pulmonary artery. So what you would do is the peak velocity and the acceleration time. Now, there are a few things which you need to do in the aortic valve. Remember that there is something called a mean aortic valve gradient, which we will see in the next two slides. But when you get a tracing, what you could do is trace the whole tracing across the waveform. And what you will get is a peak and you will get a mean gradient. The mean velocity means the mean across the time taken throughout the systole. The time taken throughout the systole is measured as the ejection time. So this is the aortic valve ejection time. This is the peak velocity and the mean velocity. There is an understanding called velocity time integral, which is nothing but a multiplication of the mean velocity into the time taken. Velocity time integral is more reliable and it's an important measure which is used to calculate the cardiac output and certain other hemodynamic calculations. The last slide is the Doppler tracing at the diaphragm and you could see that you have a cy single systolic waveform in systole and a little continuation in diastole but it has to be only in the earlier part of diastole. If you find it in the later part of diastole, that means throughout diastole, if there is a forward flow, it means that there could be obstruction proximal to this point in, in the aorta. What you see below the baseline is actually the IVC flow, a continuous venous flow which has overlapped along with the arterial flow. So these are the measures which you will take across, take across the aortic valve. And this is the end of the individual aortic, uh, individual Doppler tracing at different points. The last company of today's talk is what do we interpret at the end of all the Doppler tracings? So what is the utility in clinical cardiology? Basically, it's the hemodynamic evaluation of the heart at different places. The first most important is the transvalvular gradient. That means across four valves inside the heart, you could measure the velocities and understand if you have any stenosis. The second is the intracardiac pressures and the shunts. It gives us an idea about the pressure inside the atria and the ventricles. And also if you have additional shunts, like VSD PDA, it can give you an understanding across the shunt pressures. The third is the systolic cardiac performance, that means the systolic function and the calculation of the stroke volume and the cardiac output, and also the diastolic function. The severity of the valvular regurgitation can also be understood. And the last is going to be understanding the myocardial and the pericardial diseases, which we are not going to see today because it's a part of an abnormal heart understanding. So we will see a little about every single application. The first is the transvalvular gradient. So what you can see in this figure is below the baseline, what I have shown is the echo tracing. Normally what we see is the peak velocity. And if you trace the whole waveform, what you will get is the mean gradient. So this holds true for the AV valves and the seminal valves. However, it holds true more for the aortic valve. This particular Doppler is compared with a cat lab tracing where you will get an aortic tracing like this and the left ventricular tracing like this. So what you will get is an overlapping of both the tracings during cardiac systole. And 
This is the colored area in red, red, which means that it is peak to peak gradient between the aorta and the left ventricle. And peak to peak means it's happening at that point in time. If you put a catheter in the aorta separately and put a catheter in the LV separately, what you will get is at different points in time. So that's the peak to peak gradient. However, if you want it at the same point in time, this is what is going to be an ideal gradient. And this is what you will get based on the mean gradient. So the mean gradient is the average of the pressure gradients during the entire flow, which correlates well with the cat lab gradient. The mean gradient concept is used for the aortic valve and the left ventricular output tract, but not for the right heart. And so what we can see in this figure is, this is a child where you got uh, the aortic valve flow and you traced the Doppler waveform and what you get is a mean gradient. So you can see here the peak gradient and the mean gradient. The velocities get translated into the gradients and then you have a calculation of velocity time integral also. And this is what is used for the calculation of cardiac output, the valve surface area, etc. Now the second thing is the intracardiac pressures. How do we calculate the RA pressures, the LA pressures, the RD pressures, and the LD pressures? Now, in a normal heart, you only can use the Dopplers across the AV valves to calculate the intracardiac pressures. And where we are using the recurrent jets to calculate the intracardiac pressures. The tricuspid and the pulmonary valve regurgitation is a very common association in normal heart. But even to some extent, mitral regurgitation can also happen in normal heart. So if you have one of the regurgitant jets, you could use those jets to get the peak velocity and then calculate the intracardiac pressures. Now, in a situation where you have, say, a patent for an oval, you could use the Dopplers across that. Or if you have a ventricular septal defect or a patent ductus arteriosus, you could use Dopplers across them to calculate your pressure gradient. So in a normal heart, these are the ways, and the calculation is based on the Bernoulli's equation, and this is the modified simplified form of Bernoulli's equation, which says that pressure difference in two sides is equal to 4 multiplied by the velocity squared. The second thing is the characteristic of the Doppler pattern can also suggest the site of narrowing, but we're not going to see that for the abnormal heart. So let us see what happens here. Now what happens here is the first tracing where we see the tricuspid valve and we have a tricuspid regurgitation jet of 20. 20 is in uh, gradients and the velocity is 2.2. So it is basically velocity squared into 4 which gives you the gradient. So it is 2 to the 4, 4 for the 16 if your cursor is at Two. So that is what gives you the gradient in millimeters of mercury. Now, how do I calculate my RV pressures based on this? So the right ventricular pressures can be calculated by adding the RA pressures to the, to the TR gradient. So the RA pressures, for example, are 5, then my RV pressures are going to be 25 in this child. So you get the RV systolic pressures based on the TR gradient. You could also understand that my RV pressures are going to be the pulmonary artery pressures in absence of any right ventricular output tract obstruction. Similarly, you can use the pulmonary regurgitation jet. The pulmonary regurgitation jet can give you an idea about the pulmonary artery diastolic pressures. So what happens is you have a pulmonary regurgitation jet like this and the peak PR and the end PR velocities is going to give you an idea about the mean PA pressures and the end diastolic PA pressures. How do we do? So if it's one, one is the velocity. If you make it in terms of gradient, it's going to be four. And four plus the RA pressures, which is five, is going to give you the idea about the end diastolic pressures, which is going to be nine in this child. So the PA and diastolic pressures are RA pressures plus 4V PR square. So this is the end 
PR gradient. If you take the peak PR gradient, it will give you the mean PA pressures. So to document the PA pressures, you could use the tricuspid and the pulmonary regurgitation jet. Similarly, we can see what happens if you have an aortic regurgitation. So in this trial, we had an aortic regurgitation, and what tracing you are seeing is the aortic regurgitation tracing. This is the earlier diastole, and this is the later part of diastole, and similarly, you can find the deceleration slope. If you put a tracing across it, you will have a mean gradient. But you don't need a mean gradient for regurgitation jets. You get a peak and an end gradient. So what happens? Similarly, like we understood the PA pressures, we can understand the LA pressures. How do we get the LA pressures? Normally, we know the systolic blood pressures. So systolic blood pressures is, in general, the combination of the left atrial pressures plus the either the mitral regurgitation jet or the aortic regurgitation jet. The mitral regurgitation jet will be added to the left atrial pressures, and that will give you your systolic blood pressure. So for systolic blood pressure minus the mitral regurgitation jet is the LA pressures. Similarly, for the diastolic pressures, we could use the aortic regurgitation jet, where you subtract the aortic regurgitation velocity from the left ventricular uh, and diastolic pressures. I'm sorry here, this should be a plus sign here. So the left ventricular and diastolic pressures is diastolic blood pressures of the child minus the aortic regurgitation uh, gradients. So this is how you would use the AR gradients to check the LV and diastolic pressures. Now coming down to the third component is the assessment of the systolic function. And here we use the hydraulic orifice formula which says that the flow across a particular point is a combination of is a multiplication of the area and the velocity time integral. So flow across the aortic valve, for example, is equal to the aortic valve area into the velocity time integral. How do we get the velocity time integral? Put a Doppler across the aortic valve. How do I get the area of the valve? You have to get the diameter of the valve and then use the formula pi r squared and get the area. Once you get the area and the velocity time integral, you multiply, and that's going to be the flow volume across the aortic valve, which in an indirect way means it's the stroke volume. And you multiply the stroke volume by the heart rate, you get the cardiac output. You divide the cardiac output by the body surface area, and you get the cardiac index. There's a lot of understanding on whether this is reliable or not, but this is a way on an average to calculate the cardiac output bedside. And there are lots of machines which will have internally calibrated calculation if you actually give the measurement of the diameter and the velocity time integral it will calculate on its own the cardiac output as you can see here and you get an indexed cardiac output at the end of it uh, the second most important understanding here is the assessment of the diastolic function and check for the presence of diastolic failure. Now, this slide is very, very important because, uh, again, this is going to help you understanding the Dopplers uh, in myocardial and pericardial disease. Remember that diastolic function has something to do with the filling pressures of the heart, the ventricular compliance, and the myocardial relaxation. Also, remember that during diastole, the first Part of the diastole is the rapid filling, where it completes 80% of the filling in a normal heart. But the later part, which is the atrial contraction, has something to do with the ventricular compliance. Now, the diastole, we can understand the diastole as we can see in this figure. First, most important, what happens is there is active myocardial relaxation of the ventricles. And hence, the LV pressures become lesser than the left atrial pressures because of which the mitral valve opens up and there is a rapid ventricular filling. So here, as we can see, this is the end of ventricular systole and the myocardium starts relaxing of the left ventricle. The LV pressures fall lesser than the LA pressures and hence the mitral valve opens up. So this phase is called the isovolumic relaxation time. There's a time between the closure of the aortic valve and the opening of the mitral valve. This is the IVRT, the isovolumic relaxation time. 
and then the mitral valve opens up and then the flow starts from the left atrium to the left ventricle and this accounts for 80% of the flow in diastole. After some time, the LV pressures become more than LA pressures and what happens? There is loss of a positive driving force. That means there is a deceleration and there is diastasis. That means there is nothing happening between LA and LV. And at the end of it, the left atrium is actively contracting, which gives rise to the A wave, which is the positive wave, the atrial contraction, which accounts for 20% of the filling of the left ventricle. So as we can see, we have the IV artery, the rapid filling, the diastasis, and the atrial contraction, and this is the deceleration deceleration type. Now these four phases of the diastole have different roles to happen, different roles to uh, play during diastole and how do we assess our diastolic function? You could take into consideration the mitral or the tricuspidal inflow patterns. You could take into consideration the pulmonary vein, hepatic vein Doppler and also the tissue Doppler. So when we are doppling the mitral valve, we can measure the mitral valve A wave duration. We could measure the peak E velocity, the A velocity, and the E A ratio. We could measure the deceleration time, that means the time taken from the peak E to the end of E, and we can measure the pressure half time. This is all we can measure through Dopplers, and every single phase gives us an idea about the ventricular diastolic function. The tissue Doppler is measured at the septum, uh, at the septal surface, as you can see here, or the anterior tricuspid leaflet. And similarly, in the mitral valve, you can measure it at the free wall or the septum. So these are the ways to understand the diastolic function. And if we go back to this figure, remember that once you have diastolic dysfunction, you will have changes in the IVRT, you will have changes in the deceleration time, you will have changes in the E wave velocity, the A wave velocity, and the EA ratio. Now these are all abnormal Dopplers, which we can talk as time comes in the further classes. The assessment of the valve function is done based on the continuity equation. Now, continuity equation is again based on the same hydraulic orifice principle where you have an understanding that the flow across the valve is equal to uh, a multiplication of the area and the velocity time integral. So we have to understand that if we have no intercard actions, the flow across the circuit is going to be the same. The volume which is at this place is volume is at this place even if this area is narrowed. So can we take the understanding at two points in time, for example, the mitral valve and the aortic valve, and find the flow in one valve, one area, and then the flow in another area, these two flows are going to be the same. So based on this, we come to an understanding that a1, V1 is A2, V2. That means the multiplication of area into velocity time integral at one point is equal to A2 and velocity time integral at the second point. And when we know that A1 and SV1 is, can be measured, we can also measure the velocity at the second point, then we will get the area at the second point. So this is how we can calculate the area, we can calculate the function at a particular valve which is abnormal. We saw in the previous figure something called the pressure half time. The pressure half time is the time interval for the peak pressure to reach half and there is a formula to calculate the pressure half time. There's a formula to calculate the mitral valve area based on the pressure half time. So the pressure half time understanding is used commonly for the mitral valve and the aortic valve for mitral valve when it's stenose and for the aortic valve when it's leaking. And based on that, we get an understanding of the severity of stenosis or regurgitation. So as we can see here, the mitral valve stenosis, we do a tracing of the mitral valve Doppler pattern. What we get is the peak and the mean, but also the pressure half time and the valve area. So the 
Pressure has time gives an idea of the mitral as area and the degree of stenosis. The last understanding is the regurgitation volume fraction and the orifice area calculation. I have to tell you that practically most of the centers would not use it, but theoretically you need to understand that there are two ways to calculate the regurgitation volume and fraction. One is the volumetric method and second is the PISA method. The volumetric method says that the regurgitant volume is uh, calculated based on the total forward flow across the regurgitant valve minus the systemic stroke volume. For example, if we take a situation of the mitral regurgitation, if we want to know how much volume is regurgitating back into the left atrium, we can calculate the forward volume across the mitral valve minus the aortic valve volume, which is going to give us the regurgitant volume. And what is the regurgitant fraction? It's the regurgitant volume divided by total forward volume multiplied by 100. That means the percentage of the volume uh, which is regurgitated compared to the volume which is going across the mitral valve. And the second is the PISA method. This is the proximal isovelocity surface area. And what happens is that this is the LA, this is the LV, and when it's regurgitating, you will see series of isocircles across the valve. And then you measure the uh, velocity, which is proximal to the opening, and the velocity, which is on the outer surface. And then you calculate your regurgitant volume uh, based on the area and velocity. This is one way how we can come to an understanding about the uh, valve. Now, I think we are done with your, our talk today, and we are coming to the quiz confident. I would just like to ask all of you, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask so that then we can proceed to the uh, quiz. We have uh, maybe around eight or nine questions for all of you. Any questions? No questions, then we can proceed with our quiz. It's going to be a simple quiz and uh, of practical utility for everybody. And you will need to keep your pencil and pen ready because there are some calculations in some of the questions. So we'll proceed with the first uh, slide. Uh, we, it is like a multiple choice question and you just have to tell the answer. Either you can write one, two, three, four in your chat box or write the answer. All following statements are true for a continuous wave Doppler except so there are four options. One is that aliasing does not occur. Second is range resolution is not possible. Third is high velocities can be recorded. And fourth is blood flow along the entire beam. So we have the answer, yes. So that's right. The first answer is the right answer. Aliasing does occur. Because in a continuous wave Doppler, aliasing does not occur. That means that you can pick up velocities very high and your Nyquist limit is very high. You do not have any aliasing and the answer one is the correct answer. We will go to the next question. Yes, we have lots of correct answers. Uh, we come to the next question. You are doing an echo for a two-day-old baby. You find the SVC flow increased on color and pulse Doppler velocities. The possibilities would, would be one, two, three, four. Yes, so Abhinav is telling that it's four. And yes, so we are getting multiple other answers. And that's right. The answer is four. That means if we have a systemic AV fistula, TAPVC, PAPVC, we have increased velocity in the SPC Doppler. This slide I have particularly put because you all should do routinely Dopplers of SVC, especially in children where you are not getting a diagnosis for your symptoms and PAH. We come to the third question now. 
the PA systolic and the diastolic pressures you need to calculate. If your TR velocity is 4.5 meters per second, PR velocity is 3 meters per second, assuming your RA pressure is 10. Okay, so Abhinav is saying three. Abhinav, can we recheck it? See that you need to calculate uh, first the TR gradient. So you would do 4.5 squared into 4. And then you add your RA pressure, which is 10. Your PR pressure is, uh, uh, PR gradients are 3 into 3 and into 4. Plus, you have to add your RA pressures. Don't forget to add your RA pressures at the end of it. Remember, you need to add your RA pressures to calculate your PA pressures. Uh, so I'm getting answers like one. That's right. One is the correct answer. All of you can do it once again. It's 4.5 into 4.5 into 4 plus 10. So the right answer is 91 by 46. We proceed to the next question. The gradient across the PFO is 20 from the left to the right atrium. All the following congenital heart diseases are possible except. Yes, so what is happening is the LA pressures are higher than RA, but they are higher by 20. And so anything which can add to extra flow into the left atrium is going to give you high LA pressures. And the answer is four, that's right. Coming to the next question. The pulse Doppler wave uh, can satisfactorily measure velocities up to dash. I haven't put numbers because it looked a little more confusing, so you could just write the answer here. What is the peak velocity which a pulse wave Doppler can measure? Yes, so the answer is two meters per second. And after that, what happens is aliasing. That's right. And remember meters per second. In fetal life, when you do Dopplers, it's all centimeters per second. So your uh, unit is also important. Two meters per second is the right answer. That's right. So coming to the next question. The calculation of PA pressures can be done by using one, two, three, or four. Yes, so we are getting answers. It is one, that's right. Um, I, I got an answer as two. So, you know, forward flow velocity across the main Palmi artery in general does not give us an understanding. I agree that when there is severe pH, you could use that velocity waveform to understand whether you have an obstructive disease or not, but in general, it does not give us an understanding about normal PA pressures. We cannot document the amount of PA pressures based on that. So the answer would be gradient across the PDA. The MR gradient gives us an information about the LA pressures, and the gradient across the ASP also gives us an information about the left atrial pressures. Coming to the next one. Systemic blood pressure is 160 by 80, and the AR and diastolic velocity is 4 meters per second. 
can we calculate the left ventricular and diastolic pressures? Yes, so the answer is you need to calculate the AR first gradients that means it's 4 for the 16 for the 64 and then subtract that from the systolic diastolic blood pressure so that 18 minus 64 which is 16 this is an important way to understand the LV diastolic pressures in children with aortic regurgitation and if they have additional LV dysfunction it's a beautiful way to get an understanding can we proceed to the next slide? Is everybody clear with this? Because I got only one answer from Abhinav. Anybody has any questions? Okay, so we proceed to the... Uh, it, it, this is the end of the talk today and the end of the quiz today. Any questions from anybody?